Snap Judgment Studios. The first professional I spoke to about starting something called Snap Judgment, he said that I shouldn't speak into a microphone because of my speech impediment. Until that moment, I didn't know I had a speech impediment. So we had to start without his help. Instead, I asked for help from the people who'd heard these stories. And if you've ever been unable to get out of the car, the kitchen, the office, until you've heard the end of the story, please become one of us and support the show that makes it happen right now at snapjudgment.org. You can get Snap stuff, including Snap music, a chance to pitch your story or a backstage pass to spook live. But join at a level that makes sense for you at snapjudgment.org. It is the joy of my life to bring you these tales. Please know that Snap Storytelling, narrated by a guy with a speech impediment, simply doesn't happen unless you make it happen. So I'm asking from one snapper to another, please stop the show for just a moment. Just a moment. And make it happen at snapjudgment.org. Thanks. Snap Judgment is brought to you by Progressive, where customers who save by switching their home and car save nearly $800 on average. Quote at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates, national average 12-month savings of $793 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Snappers, I don't know. Maybe it's just looking back at my own life, the connections, the events, the crazy, and knowing that even after several years of Snap, there are stories, personal stories I haven't told you, not because they aren't meaningful to me, not because they haven't changed me. No, I haven't told you these stories because I wonder sometimes if you would believe them. So many things happen that couldn't really have happened but they happen enough so that when someone tells me you're not going to believe this I often say try me today in Snap Judgment we proudly present Beyond Belief amazing stories that shouldn't have happened my name is Ben Washington please understand that Accidents are almost never accidental when you're listening listening to Snap Judgment. Snappers, have you ever had a memory that just got stuck in your head? Maybe on loop, a memory you just couldn't shake? Wow. When Tamir Habaka was just a wee lad, he had a lifetime of them. Snap Shana Sheely brings us to Mir's story from the northern Israeli village of Yanu. Snap Judgment. I was at a wedding with my parents. Uh, I was sort of dragged to the wedding because I didn't like to attend family events. I was a small kid. I wanted to stay home, watch TV, you know, play on the computer. Tamir was five years old in a strange village two hours away from his house. I was dragged by my mother to sit next to her, and then I told her I want to go to the bathroom. I walked past, you know, other kids. I was the fat kid of the group. Uh, We got into this argument. They made fun of my hair and, you know, how I look. And then I, I got into a fight with them. I got a punch in the head. At that point, like, I, I am being, like, uh, controlled from that moment on. I'm feeling dizzy, I'm feeling nauseous, and I have a terrible headache. I was supposed to go back to the table where my mother and father were sitting, but I took the opposite direction and I went out of the wedding. I thought it's sweating, like this cold sweat. I thought it feeling like I was going to be sick. As a kid, I was afraid of my mother and father. He tries forcing himself back to the wedding, but his body isn't listening. My body is not re- responding to my request. It's like it's, I'm being pushed, like 
uh, you know the uh, it's like a magnet pulling uh, a metal to it so now I'm I'm walking on my own without even knowing where I'm going I was afraid because I didn't know where I was going but I I had this feeling like I've been here before it's like playing a video game and playing it again where you know where you where are you where you're supposed to go uh, I'm stopping traffic at a certain point crossing the streets and going into alleys and uh, I'm walking in a calm familiar environment I'm, I'm uh, touching the walls next to me I'm going around corners and you know grabbing poles or you know and how does how does your body feel in that moment like like I I've I, I've been here before like it's it's familiar it's safe it's something that i did before and then i i reached this house and i managed to open the gate from the inside so you just go you open the gate and just walk in like yeah i i even knew how to open it the lock is, was from the inside like i i knew how to do that i'm knocking on the door a lady opened the door an old lady at first she didn't even see me she was looking like around I'm grabbing her by the dress and I'm talking to her like, uh, hello, my, your name is Dunya, you're my mother. That was weird to me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think she was more worried because a five-year-old is on his own and he's knocking on doors, you know. <laughs> she didn't say anything. She invited me in. Wow. And so then you walk in. I went down the stairs inside the house itself. I knew how to go down and I sat on one of the couches my, I remember my feet are not touching the ground. <laughs> and he starts talking, listing names out of nowhere. Your name is Dur, your name is Naim. I know you. I don't know how, I don't know where, but I know you. Uh, I've been here before. They wanted to hear more, but everything stopped. And then I felt like there's no room inside my body. Like, it, my head has two people inside it you know I remember everything spinning afterwards it's like someone unplugging you you know like you talk and talk and talk and then like it's over the battery is over the battery is over and then I felt like sort of a crack and and everything just went black five-year-old Tamir fainted I blacked out His parents, frantic at the wedding, put out a call for a missing child, figured out where he was, and picked him up from the house. And then, like, I woke up in in my parents' car, and we were on the way home. Uh, And from that moment on, I started being, like, uh, having these fevers. I I went to, like, sort of a a physical breakdown. I, I was sick for almost a month. Tamir got so sick that his parents took him to the hospital. He stayed there for two weeks. Doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong. They thought it might be anxiety or something worse. For a five-year-old to have these kind of, you know, mental breakdowns, it's weird. Yeah. (laughs) Because they didn't know, like, what was the cause of this breakdown. They, 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 They feared that I have other problems, you know. Like a tumor or something. Tamir didn't have a tumor. Doctors couldn't find a cause of his illness. It was his friends and family who diagnosed him. They said an old soul had been reborn. In his body. I know it's it's weird. It's something that you don't hear every day. But I'm going to be honest here. It's, it's even crazier for me. Tamir's 23 now. He lives in the northern Israel village of Yanuch and belongs to an ethnic minority called Druze. Being a Druze is not an easy thing. We're going to start from that. Tamir isn't religious. I never touched the holy book. Like Maybe it's blank inside. I don't know. The Druze faith is shrouded in secrecy, and to even touch the holy book, you have to sacrifice modern comforts like TV. Tamir isn't ready for that. He knows that the Druze believe in God and that a main belief is reincarnation. What I understood is that when people die, they are born again. Like at the second that you close your eyes, you're going to open them as a baby. Uh, After that, you're going to live again and you're going to live again. You're going to live again. You're going to live again. You know, it's it's not it's not going to stop. 
but I see it as as a rational explanation of where does the soul go? Like this, it doesn't go anywhere, and it, it it goes to a different body. According to Drew's faith, everyone, everywhere is reincarnated, but not everyone remembers their past lives. But the thing is, the people who remember, they died in a tragic way. Which is why the woman who opened the door to Tamir when he was five years old was ready. I think she was waiting for uh, waiting for her son to reincarnate, I think. Her son, Wafa, had died when he was on reserve duty. Uh, Wafa died, he was killed in the army, so uh, he's going to talk eventually. So they, wa- they waited for a small kid at that age to come. And you say they weren't shocked? Like when you opened the door and you said, you're my mother, even if she was expecting you, wouldn't she be shocked? If I were the mother of Wafa, I probably would cry or I would, I, I don't know. Well, she, she was very excited. She had tears in her eyes. Uh, but I think the people that were inside the house expected that, like they wanted that. And there were a lot of people who missed Wafa. Wafa left behind sisters, brothers, a child, and a 23-year-old pregnant widow, Hanadi. They wanted Wafa back. From then on, a parade of people from Wafa's family started showing up at Tamir's doorstep. Wafa's sister was the first to visit. When she came, she sort of um, forced words out of me. And I was like sweating like crazy and had fevers. And after that, they came again. Third visit, my wife came with them. So this weird thing happens when Tamir starts talking about Wafa's family. He says his family, his wife. What he means is Wafa's wife. Yeah, she she came. I remember she was wearing a black dress because her husband died. So it's been five years she's wearing all black. She was in the tw- her 20s and she was blonde. And I was very shy and nervous. I was shy to answer some of the things that they were asking me. Do you remember her? She's your wife, and you know. During that first visit, Wafa's wife brought a bag of photos with her. You know, uh, me holding my baby and my wife next to me and my friends next to me. Like one of the pictures was uh, in a park, in a national park, on Independence Day. I remember like, where was it or when was it? Yeah, so I've noticed when, when you're talking right now, you interchange the meaning of me, like when you say my friends. Um, and I'm wondering if that's confusing for you, because as a listener, it's confusing for me. When you say my, it's like Wafa or Tamir? Well, I always need to explain or to, you know... To clarify that I'm talking about me or I'm talking about my past life or I'm talking about, you know. Yeah. And is that confusing for you? Like when you're trying to tell people about your experience and you say my or me, do you know which one you're talking about? Like, do you know if you're talking about Tamir or Wafa? Well, <laughs> I, how can I say it? When I talk like, I feel like we're the same guy, but, you know, in a different story. Which was hard, especially as a kid, trying to figure out relationships with Wafa's relatives, like Wafa's wife, who was more than 20 years older than Tamir. I used to sit in her lap and hug her and, you know, I was four or five years old. She always hugged me like I felt warm, like my mother, like she cares about me. I saw that she was desperate. The whole family was desperate. They wanted more time with Wafa. Tamir obliged. He spent a lot of time with Wafa's family. One day, when he was seven years old, he went with Wafa's brothers to see a house Wafa had been building before he died. It was, it's a really dangerous place to, for a kid to walk in because like, you could fall, you could break something. So I remember I, I walked two floors down. There was this huge red door. I remember opening it. it. It was really heavy. Tamir lost control of his body, like at the wedding. Well, it more feels like someone giving you signs or even like whispering in your ear, like a, a grown-up taking your head and walking you around. I, 
I'm grabbing one of the handles on the drawer and I'm, I'm, I'm taking it out. I took the whole drawer out. Underneath the drawer, I'm grabbing this metal things, this brown metal thing, and I, I'm taking them out. It's, it's uh, live grenades. Tamir had found a stash of ammunition, which in any other circumstances would feel dangerous. I held them before, so I wasn't scared at all. I've been here, I've done that, so I could, I'm, I'm, I'm touching it again, I'm, I'm here, so it's okay, it's, it's safe. Tamir explained to the brothers that he, Wafa, stole the grenades from the army. <laughs> I can't get in trouble for, for saying that because it, he's dead, you know? <laughs> you can't judge me now. But. And that he had been planning to remove the grenades. I told them that I didn't get a chance to because I, I was killed. And now they're looking at me, they're really shocked, and uh, I went back upstairs. It was one of my priorities when I wanted to get back. I think that's why I, I did that when I first walked in. I wanted to get, take them away from there, or even to, you know, to throw them away or something. Tamir knows this all sounds unbelievable to people outside the Druze community. The weird thing is that people here in the Druze community see it as a normal thing. Like, everyone's cool about it, and it's normal, yeah. But Tamir was not so cool about it. In fact, he was freaked out. Mostly because he had no control over when Wafa popped into his life. I used to dream a lot of seeing my wife in, like, in her wedding dress, uh, standing in the middle of the ocean, and I, one, try to catch her, and I fall inside the water, and I, I suffocate. Like at, at the end of every dream, you feel like they're stuffing two people inside you and there's no room. So like you can't breathe, like the air is going and leaving your body and then you wake up sweating and you know, I had a big problem with, uh, you know, wetting my bed. Every time that it happened to me, I woke up like, you know, uh, with a wet bed, it's like I couldn't control my body at all. As he got a little older, he wanted more control over Wafa. That Wafa that showed up without asking in his body, mind, and dreams. He tried summoning Wafa. Like, I tried uh, hypnosis and Ouija boards and, you know, a lot of spiritual guides and people and, uh, you know, ways to communicate with spirits and everything else. But I'm afraid to what's going to happen. Like, maybe at a certain point I'm going to have a mental breakdown and, I don't know, maybe he's going to take control over everything, you know? After high school, he started distancing himself from Wafa. Wafa was a big meat eater, so Tamir became a vegetarian. And I didn't eat meat at all. Wafa was fit and muscular. Well, I'm sort of a Seth Rogen kind of a guy. (laughs) The last straw came at a family barbecue. Wafa's family barbecue. I told them, like, "I'm I'm a vegetarian now. I hate meat. They saw it as a weird thing, and they were like... Like, they looked at me in a weird way, like, how? Like, Wafa really liked me, so this is, there's something wrong here, you know? And I said, like, I'm not Wafa, I'm Tamir. That's when Wafa's widow, Hanadi, walked out of the room. A few moments later, she returned to the barbecue holding the uniform Wafa was wearing when he died. And uh, we opened the whole thing. She, she gave it to me. I touched it. And I felt really awkward. She started crying, and I felt that you know, like she needs, she needs, she needs someone now. Like I wanted to sit and talk as Tamir. I wanted them to, you know, to talk about normal things, life, and everything else. But no, they kept like going back, going back. She, she just wanted her husband back. You know, she wanted someone to help her. She wanted someone to be there. It was obvious that there was a tension like in the air, but again, I wouldn't blame her. Like she was 20 or something when this all of this happened and she was really connected to me or Buffa, you know, and she she missed him a lot. I was like I felt that slowly and gradually they were changing me to Buffa. I I waited for them to ask me to act like him or to even grow my mustache like him, you know. Like they wanted Buffa again, not just spiritually but you know from the outside Tamir didn't want to be at Wafa's barbecue comforting his sobbing wife so he stood up 
and left. At least I want to be treated as Tamir, you know, I want to have this chance of living, give me a chance to live as Tamir, <laughs> not as, uh, you know, Wafa. Wafa had his chance. He wanted to go as far away as he could, to leave Wafa's family, to leave the tiny Druze community, to leave Israel. He flew into Zurich and enrolled in a study program. He left Wafa behind in the village. He's on the bench now. <laughs> I'm, I'm on the court. <laughs> One of the first things he did in Switzerland was get a tattoo. It's a stone. It's like a jewel. Evil hands coming out of it on top. And an owl like escaping the hands. It's almost being catched by the hands. But it's escaping them with feathers flying everywhere. So it's like escaping, you know, being suppressed. He went back to Israel a year later. Like I came back, I, 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 yeah, I came back with, with a beard and with tattoos everywhere. And and he fell in love with Lillian. I was playing the guitar. And uh, as soon as she walked in, I stopped playing. <laughs> I, I didn't know how. <laughs> when he started dating Lillian, Waffle wasn't coming around much. I, I didn't deal with it that much, you know. I have, I have a life, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Tamir was living his life. He proposed to Lillian, she said yes. And then, after a long break from Wafa, Tamir and Lillian got an invitation to Wafa's daughter's wedding. My younger daughter's wedding, she's the same age as me now. I was surprised that they invited me because I haven't talked to them in a while, but... Lillian was also surprised. Imagine... Celebrating a wedding with a woman who thinks your fiancé is her husband. The love of her life. And my fiancé said that it would be awkward if she was at the party. Tamir had a decision to make. To go back with the risk of getting involved with the family again, or to stay away and disappoint all of Wafa's relatives. I really thought about that. Like, do I want that again? Tamir didn't want to get sucked back in, and Lillian really didn't want him hanging around Wafa's wife. But Tamir knew he was different now. He told Lillian he had things under control. So now I can control it. Like, I'm the one who could control everything. Like, Wafa could just be there. I could, like, bound him to, to not to do anything, you know, to just to put, like, handcuffs on his hands and just put him in a corner. Like, he can't do anything. And I'm the one, I'm the boss, you know? So they got into the car and drove the two hours to Wafa's village for his daughter's wedding. Did it for the bride so so she wouldn't feel bad. He and Lillian walk in a little late and no one's talking to them. Tamir feels awkward and cracks a joke. As a joke, like, do you start the wedding without me, you know? And then the family swarms him. Everyone gathered? <laughs> it was crazy. Like, the father came, you know? <laughs> and and everyone was crying, even the men. Like, my nephew, who, the fir- who was the first one to come to my house, he was there, and I haven't seen him in, like, 10 years. Yeah, he was crying, like, he was shaking. Then, out of the corner of his eye, he sees Hanadi, Wafa's wife, and he has something to get off his chest. I told her, like, Wafa would want you to know that he's sorry he's not there. You know, and I told that to my daughter too. Like, I, if I said that he's sorry, he's not, he can't be at your wedding, and he's sorry he wasn't there when you grew up, and you know, when you finished school, and they put Tamir at the head of the table with the groom and his father. I sat at the table where the head of the family sits, you know, and uh, then like the you know picture time <laughs> after after everyone ate. There was this one picture where, like, all of the sons and their were their wives, and they took me and my wife from other from the past life, and we like they put us next to each other. I remember, like, my fiance was was, <laughs> was <laughs> she was like furious, and I said, "You're going to die," you know, <laughs> like, "Why did you take the pic that picture?" And I'm like, I, I, "There's nothing I can do. <laughs> it wasn't my fault. Like, it was you know, you can't say no. It would be rude." <laughs> can I can I, can I be honest? Yeah. Uh, like I know that maybe this is my last time here with everyone. You know, 
I'm going to stop going. I'm going to stop meeting everyone. So it's, this is the last thing. And it was for a good cause. It wasn't like to, you know, I, I did I did it like to, to make them feel better. Because I, I always remind them of him, you know, for them not to forget. Thank you, Tamir, for sharing your story with the snap and shout out to Dr. Raja Saeed Faraj, the author of Reincarnation in the Druze Community. The original sound design for that story was by Renzo Gorio. It was produced by Shana Sheely. Now it's about that time. It is, but it doesn't have to be because we've got more Snap just waiting for you right now. Subscribe to the amazing storytelling podcast, snapjudgment.org. And this is not the news. No way is this the news. In fact, you could build the most magnificent sandcastle ever made at high tide, confident that it wouldn't be destroyed in low tide, only to realize that you really don't know what the terms low tide and high tide actually mean, and you would still not be as far away from the news as this is. This is PR.